Damas y caballeros, es para mí un gusto presentarles mi amigo personal Orlando Samoins, que es profesor del distinguido Instituto de Estudios Políticos de la Universidad Católica Portuguesa. Es profesor de filosofía política con especialidad en las ideas de Adam Smith, Montesquieu y James Madison. Enseña también pensamiento político en Católica Business School. Adicionalmente, imparte el curso de teoría de juegos con especialidad en las ideas de la Escuela de Public Choice. Y, además, es profesor del reconocidísimo, del reconocidísimo profesor Juan Carlos Espada, que es el mayor referente del liberalismo en Portugal. Ha sido también invitado varias veces a la reunión general de la sociedad Montpellerin. Profesor Orlando, has publicado varios trabajos, como por ejemplo el capítulo Un liberalismo en ideologías políticas contemporáneas, el único libro sobre ideologías políticas en Portugal. Su tesis, su tesis Resultados y mérito, un estudio sobre la orden espontánea de Friedrich Hayek. E, actualmente, es editor jefe de la, del periódico académico Nova Ciudadanía, que es el único periódico portugués académico que no es socialista. Es un placer para mí darle la palabra al profesor. Muchas gracias. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernardo. He's always too kind, but actually it's indeed true that Nova Cidadania is the only journal not uh, socialist uh, in Portugal. Um, yes, well, thank you. I didn't know you knew, you knew Spanish so well, but uh, uh, unfortunately I'll, I, I think I'll speak in English and... Um, If you don't understand, I don't know, you know, raise your hands. I'll try to be as slow as I can. The argument, it's not, I mean, that difficult. So I think we can, we can just um, proceed. Um, thank you very much for being here. Allow me this non-native English. I think that there's just two of us speaking in English. But um, I promise next time I'll be more fluent in Spanish and then we can try. Um, I have a very small you know, presentation over the PowerPoint, but just with the quotations, so it's not that fancy. I, don't, I won't show any graphs or anything connected with the, with the drugs decriminalization, which is my main topic. You'll see that the argument is a bit philosophical. I hope you like it. I'm not here to convince you or to persuade you. As you'll see, some of, some of the argument will actually border upon things you might already believe, but some other things I'll just try to provoke you. As I, you know, as I, two years to be teaching, that means that, I mean, we often um, consider arguments which we don't completely or fully believe just to test it out. So, I mean, this is something that I would submit to test. And I would start like this. In the world we live, I mean, we tend to believe that in order to achieve a certain result, we would need to rationally engage with that result or trying to use some powers or coercive powers in order to get it. You, we know that this is not true from Hayek, from Popper, Oakeshott, and all that. That is that sometimes there are results we can achieve without really intending to achieve them. And I think that is, broadly speaking, what I will tell you about. Sometimes coercion might not be the best means in order to achieve something. Uh, so my first part is called something like Rules Emerging from Anarchy. And I want you to do this thought, experiment, uh, this thought experiment with me. Imagine that nothing is said beforehand. It is not obvious what happens when nothing is dictated beforehand. Imagine you want to meet with someone, with another person. Of course, that, I mean, if you want to meet with someone to have an encounter, it would be much better to just arrange a place and a time suitable to both. But I'll make it more difficult and I'll tell you, well, imagine you want to meet with someone but you don't know who the person is. Imagine you have to meet with someone, even from this group, but you don't know who the person is. And um, some theories say that uh, at the border between game theory and um, decision theory, that it is not impossible to match path even if you don't know the person that you shall or not meet. For instance, some uh, theories say that if you want to meet someone you don't know, there are actually some likelihood you'll meet the person. 
Some thinkers say that if two persons who do not know each other wanted to meet, they could do so. For instance, there are lists of cities, often quoted, and specific places where you would find the person. So, I mean, we tend to say the same answer, and as far as the other person is giving the same answer as we are, probably we could find a middle way. Uh, Ian McLean is not really far from li being a libertarian or something. He says, look at the sentence, there is an infinity of possible places and 140 possible times, like if, if you count at each minute is a possible time. But half of the subjects of an inquiry made by Schelling and Coleman say that half of the subjects would choose a certain station. They are, they, they are asking this, this uh, question in New York and near half of them would choose noon. So you might not know anything about the person you're supposed to meet and guess what? More than half will actually say the same thing. By that, it means that they would even, you know, they would really meet at noon. So central train stations, sometimes midnight or sometimes at noon, are often chosen by those who know absolutely nothing about those whom we are trying to meet. The city most often quoted is New York, London and Paris are the next ones. There is a chance that two people with no contact could meet on the 1st of January of a given year. So if, if you ask someone, well, in which day of the year would you pick up to meet someone you don't know? Many people say 1st of January, so then guess what? They would actually meet on the 1st of January. So if we relax this hypothesis and include some time of knowledge about each other, about a person, or the reason for this meeting to take place, uh, then the chance of, light, of matching increases. The lesson then is simple. We do not need to have an enforcing mechanism to have order. Order can be the result of spontaneous interaction. Well, we know that by Hayek, but it's always good to know that statistically it also works. So then we can also say that, you know, these people that consider that grown apparatus of free interaction can be cha chaotic, licentious, weak, or morally neutral, uh, they, I mean, they might be invited to reconsider this. When we actually think about emerging rules of conduct resulting from human interaction, we can see that these chaotic, licentious, and weak apparatus of free interaction won't really happen. Um, let me give you an example, which I really like. It's the example of carpool. Carpool is... Um, basically a method by which people give free rides to each other, to people who they don't know. And people who do not know each other share a car and uh, split the costs between them. This practice is, uh, you know, um, takes place in the United States mainly, but it's starting here in Europe, probably you heard about. So we, we can actually argue that um, the situation started in some sort of anarchy. Nothing was said beforehand, and now we have a system of uh, free lifts in the car or, or free rider movement in the car. And um, um, at a given time and place, some concrete place near some certain sidewalks uh, started to be the place for each one with a car uh, and, uh, and willing to share the car in this carpool mechanism this, this place started to be the place for the carpool. No one said in advance, well, let's, you know, let's take this sidewalk and meet here. But some sidewalks start to be more you know, used. It's like you know, the idea of the central station. There are some spots that you know, currently and uh, more recurrently people just use. So, I mean, but this does not mean, actually on the contrary, that these places found through interaction are arbitrary or again cha chaotic. On the contrary, as you see, there are some, you know, fixed places, fixed rules, fixed times that actually happen to take place without us telling a word beforehand. In fact, the carpool locations were the most convenient, otherwise they would not even be considered for such a purpose. So actually it was places where the cars could actually stop and take, you know, someone in to give a lift to some, you know, place. The time and place determined was actually then found to be the most proper time and place, and all the other alternatives were turn, uh, turned down, but they were turned down not by 
you know, mandatory action or by coercion of the state, they were just turned down. Now let's make the, you know, these even more interesting. Because, well, you can say, well, this carpool thing is very efficient, but now let is, let's make it more than efficient. So let's say that, and again, I'm not trying to convince you, far from that, let's say that actually these results from interaction can be good uh, to some extent, can be morally accepted. For instance, at some point, some women started not to show up to carpool with other people. They just disappeared. And the consequences were devastating as the number of cars willing to carpool decreased and the waiting time in queue increased. And, I mean, the system was being um, destroyed. So in order to restore the business, some men started to think that, well, we must behave as gentlemen and probably we should uh, allow women not, uh, to not allow women to stand alone in the sidewalk. So let's give them the priority in the carpool. And that was actually quite good fun because a tacit rule arose, a practical rule, uh, which gave the women a priority in the queue. So in this process of carpool, women may never stand alone in the, in, in the sidewalk. They always are preferred. Um, by knowing beforehand that they, the women, would never be left alone at the sidewalk, women returned to the carpool venture. The queues diminished and efficiency thrived. It was in everybody's interest, self-interest, to sustain a laudable and moral rule of conduct, saying women have priority. Again, without an act of legislation or regulation, a general rule was found by the interaction and its efficacy, and it is easy to argue that it, is a, it has or it entails a moral dimension. This rule, which gives priority to women, is not neutral. In fact, it gives priority to people considered more vulnerable or just to the ones who didn't feel comfortable with the previous rule, which was uh, first come, first served. This, the carpool practice also led the creation of another spontaneous rule. For instance, travels in, inside the car, inside the carpool, are not supposed to talk about football, religion, or politics. Don't, don't ask me why. Uh, it was by experience that this rule came about too. This is certainly a further constraint on liberty of the passengers. And yet it was in liberty and in free interaction that they choose to establish it. It is uh, a voluntary and generally accepted. My argument then would be go, it would go like this. To enjoy liberty is often to know where or how to curtail it, liberty, by means of general rules. These general rules was not, were not meant to hamper liberty, but actually it allows us to enjoy it fully. Otherwise, we would lose these good practices with good results. Then it is because we treasure liberty, I think, that we may accept some form of rule of law. Again, I'm not trying to convince you, but some may agree. And some may also agree that some sec uh, excesses of liberty leads to lic licentiousness. Um, and here let me, do a, like, let me start with a deeper note. Some people say that our ancestors in the Genesis were expelled from the Garden of Eden precisely for taking a bite out, out, out of the only apple they could not reap. To some medieval philosophers, the so-called fall of humanity represents the passage from a state of perfection to the state we are in, full of injustice, diseases like Ebola, death and all that, war, so it seems that, you know, according to these authors of the Bible, let's put it like that, a sneaky snake enticed Eve's appetite over proper limits, leading humanity towards damnation. Now we are all doomed. But look at this carefully. And now let's look at it with Adam Smith. Um, it is true that, I mean, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden felt tempted to know more and to know as much as God. That's why they rip the apple. But maybe they were conceived as such. I mean, why did they listen to the snake first place? Therefore, we can argue that temptation 
lay inside our hearts before the snake came to visit us. They were ultimately, they, Adam and Eve, were ultimately designed not to be perfect. They are imperfect, otherwise they would never listen to the devil. This is more or less some of the strain of thought that came from the, some of the Scottish philosophers in the 18th century. And they would speak of that as the author of nature. The author of nature is the one that conceived everything and so on and so forth. And he said, well, um, that, I mean, we, you know, uh, and he, 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 Adam Smith says that, well, he, perfect as he is, he conceived mankind in such a way that he would know exactly the power of self-love and self-interest he installed in each one of us. That is our own self-love. For the Scottish philosophers then, this natural propensity we have to indulge in our self-love could not be simply considered wrong. The only thing virtue really required was an ability to tune down or bring down the strong impulses of self-centered actions, often arose by self-love, and to the extent that these self-centered actions can be harmful to others. Hume, Smith, and Butler, all of the same period, agree that everyone is entitled to use the best of his knowledge, this sounds like Hayek, and to strain every muscle in order, every muscle to, in order to beat his or her competitors. And uh, I often quote this, uh, this is a quote that I don't have actually, but that you can, I think, follow. Adam Smith says, in the race for wealth and honors and performance, he, man, may run as hard as he can and strain every muscle in order to outstrip his competitors. But if he should jostle or throw down any of them, the indulgence of the spectators is entirely at the end. It is a violation of fair play, which they cannot admit of. So it seems that self-love is, by nature, carved in our hearts, and to some extent, it's naturally to indulge it. Atchison and Madville, in their turn, insisted that the only pure benevolence could constitute real virtue and that any compensation felt at the level of self-love was therefore a mark of this malicious you know, degree we have, something like that. On the other hand, we have Hume, Smith, Butler saying that actually, well, virtue was not to be attained by denying the impulses of self-love, but instead to moderate those impulses. For Smith, virtue was based on the degree which we tune down our passions coming within our hearts. That's not the, it's the next one. Yeah. And he defines virtue in a very interesting way. It doesn't look like that interested, but I'm telling that is. Virtue consists not in one affection. The candidates by the time were prop, propriety, benevolence, and so on. He rather says, but in the proper degree of all the affections, that all should be very emphatic. So it's like not, I mean, virtue is not simply denying your self-interest, denying your self-love, um, nurturing only one specific uh, affection. It's actually in the proper degree of all. That means that they all should be there included. It's like a basket. It's like a mash in, in which, you know, all have their place as ingredients. Um, this requires, I mean, in order for you to steer the proper degree of all affections in order to find virtue, you actually need to properly acknowledge your passions. Uh, virtue does not reside in simply denying passions. And this is more or less what actually happens in the marketplace. And I would like to go back. Yeah. Now we have this main sentence. Everybody read this. Dozens of times, um, but now it m might be clear because we are saying, you know, something about self love, enriching the other self love. Adam Smith is provoking us. He's saying, well, look at this. In the marketplace, we address ourselves not to their humanity. By the way, he didn't like humanity that much. He said, well, humanity is a sort of a spectator's virtue, but sometimes it's not that good. Sometimes it's just, um, he called, um, you know, gestures of humanity can be just weep when or crying when someone is sick or ill. Um, 
uh, just that you're not doing much. Generosity is much more important. And you have to be very generous and benevolent in order to try to fulfill the self-love of other person. So look, there's a sort of a pleonasm there. I made it in italics, their self-love. It's like it's not just to indulge their love, you know, to care for what they care. It's care for the other person as the other person really is. What is important to the other person. That's what really matters when you trade. It's not your self-love. It's actually the other person's self-love. Look at this, this, this movement. There's nothing more, you know, pure than this. The moment of trade, don't think about you. Think about the other person, but not what the other person likes, but what, what the person likes for herself, what is important for her. So that their self-love, it's, it's almost like saying, well, put yourself in his shoes and think as, as he thinks. And um, on the other side, you'll, you'll, you'll be, I mean, also, of course, uh, reaching or indulging your self-love because you probably will get, you know, richer or better off, but that's, not even, but that's even beside the point beside the point. Um, so what does this require? How can we actually care for the self-love of the others? Adam Smith said, well, again, let's tune down, bring down our, our self-centered affections. Let's use self-command. Self-command for him was very important. Let's, you know, act as if we were in the other person's shoes and uh, enter into the vicissitudes of his heart and so on and so forth. And all of this requires lots of virtue. Virtue, again, lies in the way we properly tune and adjust our passions. Guess what? Uh, even if we consider not virtue but vice, some of these can apply. There are, again, some intrinsic limits to how far we may indulge in one thing or the other, in one way or the other. Let me give you this example. Imagine a smoker. I'm not a smoker, so I can, I can be neutral in this. I know some. And uh, they always confirm this, this bias. They don't want to smoke 24 hours a day. They don't. They don't I mean, they won't enjoy it. On the, on the contrary, they often recognize that there is an increase of pleasure, or in pleasure, when they experience some time span without smoking. So, I mean, if, if you are prevented from smoking, then you enjoy it much more. And the same goes for many things connected with these affections or things that we like to indulge with our self-love. The same goes, for instance, for sensual pleasures. Uh, even in terms of sensual pleasures, we do, we do not just want quantity. We want also quality. So again, sometimes even some time span without them can really increase the pleasure when you finally get it. And Francis Hutchinson, guess who? Francis Hutchinson was the professor of Adam Smith, probably you heard about it. He's considered the father of Scottish Enlightenment. And he argues something like that. Well, even to the licentious, dissolute, and depraved, guess what? Someone who has less sex, it actually can be more attractive than someone who has more. And by this, he actually tried to tell us that, well, look at this, castity can be a very good thing then, because, I mean, it increases the whole potential. Let's go to the next. So then it's not the next, but the next one. Look at that. Professor of Adams meet in the middle of the Scottish Enlightenment. He said, now let us examine those who loser of loser conduct with relation to the fair sex. And we shall find that love of sensible pleasures is not the chief motive of debauchery, or false gallantry. Were it so, the meanest prostitutes would, be, would please as much as any. But we know suffi sufficiently that men are fond of good nature, faith, peasantry, of temper, wit, and many other moral qualities. By, it, this is by nature we care for these moral qualities. Guess what? Even in a mistress. And this may furnish us with a reason for what appears pretty un unaccountable. And I put it in, in bold just for you to see how, how, how interesting that is. That chastity itself has a powerful charm in the eyes of the dissolute, even when are attempting to destroy it. So even to the dissolute, to the depraved, chastity is a value. He will prefer someone chastity to someone who doesn't. So guess what? Again, self-restraint, restraint coming from within, 
is something that, you know, we can all perceive as, well, this is actually a good thing. So we tend to prefer the one who actually exalts greater virtue, there is self-constraint, self-control, self-command, and uh, of course this is something that we might not all agree, and I'm, I'm trying to convince you, I'm just quoting from Hutchinson, but the point is clear that liberty may not always or inevitably lead to an unstraight in action. On the contrary, liberty may actually to induce us to curb improper behavior and to impose limits on our own action, and these limits come from within. And uh, if these limits come from within, if we easily find that, you know, custody or this sort of prudence, this sort of self-control is important, if and only if may be coming from within, what is the role of the state concerning these things? And now in order to actually reach what I think could be the role of the state when it comes to things like, you know, vices or things from which we may take pleasure, uh, let me start with a medieval thinker, and now I'm getting even more provocative, which is St. Thomas Aquinas. Guess what? According to St. Thomas Aquinas, passions, and following our passions, was not good or bad. Passions for him were simply passions. Just that. It is only through mediation of reason that we would understand the morality of actions but passions are excluded from this charge precisely because they are not mediated by reason. They are precisely affections, strong affections, that come directly in what he called our soul. Passions then, according to Thomas Aquinas again, don't ask permissions and they don't concede any sort of negotiation with reason. Uh, according to Aquinas then, you may love someone or something which, which you wish not to love. I mean, you wanted to choose who you fall for, but I mean, you can't. It's passion. Um, but then, therefore, you may not say that loving something or someone is simply wrong, because in order to make it wrong, you need this intermedi intermediation and intervention of reason. Of course, I know that Ayn Rand would totally disagree with this, and some of you, some of her re readers and well think that passions are also driven by reason, stewed by reason, that's okay. But look at this, in one way or the other, some people would give up everything to love someone different. The only thing is that with Thomas Aquinas that won't be possible. Passions do not bargain with us, they are simply stronger than us. This is not to say that some vices, such as drugs, and I'm getting to the point, are completely involuntary. They are not, we know they are not. Though some people argue that the addicts turn out to be addicts, or they have like a sort of a very high propensity to turn out to be addicts, this cannot be the whole truth. This line, which believes the addicts were addicts before addiction, needs further explanation. But to some extent, um, I mean, if you follow this, we would actually argue that, you know, the vice, vice of falling in the vice of drugs or something would be inevitable due to genetic inborn combinations. I'm not a psychologist. I don't believe in this, but again, it's a psychological approach, which might not be right. But a lesson can be taken from this. This can contribute to an argument that says that to some extent, the person falling on a vice may lack some control over the vice itself. And uh, that's what the Portuguese thought in the, in the 80s. The person might need then help, not really imprisonment. And uh, now we can change from Hutchinson to David Hume. Look at what David Hume, not that, actually the next one. Oh, good, yeah, that's the one. Not that I agree with David Hume, which I don't, but look at this. Says he, were the disposal of human life so much reserved as the peculiar pr province of the Almighty, that it were an encroachment, an encroachment on his right for men to dispose of their own lives. And then he says, it would be equally criminal to act for the preservation of life as for its destruction. What does that mean? I mean, if we believed in God in the Almighty, then our life is not at our disposal. Our, our life is not ours, it's, you know, it's God's. But, and now here's the trick from David Hume. If we do not believe in God, 
we can still say that our life, we can still say that our life is our own. It's the other way around. But then, destroying it or prolonging it so contribute to its preservation or for its destruction has again to be a bit neutral. So why on earth would the state tell you that you cannot destroy, you know, that would be morally the same thing as saying that you should preserve. So to allow the, the states to be the sort of the mighty guardian of our, of our life is to endow the state with a coercive right and guess what? To imprison against our will. The state should then could act coercively, as it does around the world except in Portugal, and tells us that this act of violence, the coercion it applies, it's because our life is more important for the state than it is for us. Look at this. It's a bit tricky. In this case, the state does not authorize, for instance, suicide or drugs. And... So it actually said, well, your life is not worth for you, it's worth for me, for me state. So that's why you might not destroy it. The state, to some extent, is holding us as hostage. It forces us to live a life in freedom if and only if we are healthy and productive. We live only as contributors to the welfare state. Well, we all know that, indeed. I mean, we cannot be shooting here in all day in our home because then we would be just receiving a pension or something. We're not being productive. Then, if we fall into disgrace and drugs, the state actually accelerates the pace of our own destruction. It actually, you know, coercively imprisons you and so on and so forth. But this is not all. If we allow the state to tell us what is wrong or right or which vices we are not, to allow, we are not allowed to indulge, where do we draw the line? If the state criminalizes vice, what kind of rewards does it bestow as in virtue? It attributes to us in virtue. How does the state then behave? If the state wants to enforce its own vision of what is good, namely to preserve our lives, it may be actually starting or start forcing everyone to be virtuous by mandate. And they are doing that. If we actually... I mean, we are, we, are, we are taking this uh, path and we will soon wake up in the world where the state will tell us how many days we should go to the gym or then it's not just, you know, simply prolonging life or preserving life. It will be really forcing us to be virtuous citizens like the state can force us to play the violin, to appreciate Picasso. Where do they really draw the line? Uh, next, the state will probably forbid us to eat bacon or sugar candy. It is actually proven by some studies that more people die of overeating than from the use of drugs. So one, one way, or one day we'll wake up and it will be forbidden to eat you know, bacon or, some, or something like that. And there are already all kinds of restrictions, such as on the place we can smoke or not, some including our private houses, can you imagine that? Uh, a note of history could be worthwhile, say, I say, only the Nazis, you know, started with this banning and restrictions upon smoking. But that was because they wanted to reach the perfect man, the last man, the overman. And uh, they didn't really authorize each one to be as he is. Guess what? We are all imperfect and this gives our humanity. We might not want to be perfect. We might want to live life in liberty and to be free to enjoy our own perfect activities. Michael Okershott explains this very well. Sometimes, you know, libertarians don't read Michael Okershott. I know he's a sort of a conservative, but he's quite right in this. He says that in the center of a free society, we find a disposition to do what we want, activities which define our personal identity. For what do we want liberty? Think about it. According to Okershott, we want liberty to enjoy our own way of living. That is, he gives some examples to go fishing, to entertain friends. Speaking of entertaining friends, and I'm, I'm already told that I have just some minutes, but speaking of which, I would like to make you a comparison between several kinds of drugs because some drugs are actually legal, others are not. That would make, you know, make us go very far. But it was always you know, acceptable for people to, be, to, to drink alcoholic drinks except in the case of prohibition. 
Uh, some people say that it's actually because if you actually um, drink more than you should, you'll feel sick. At some point of the night, you'll always hear someone saying, I mean, if you're all getting drunk, you will always hear someone saying, I will never drink again. That's when the person's getting very sick. So alcohol has a sort of um, a limit um, and pleasure turns to nausea, to nausea at some point and, and that's the point you shall stop, please. Otherwise, you'll be like, you know, throwing up next day. Um, but it is indeed, on the same regard, a great mistake to restrain distribution of alcohol through legal action. We had this, you know, uh, prohibition, dry law, things like that. Uh, at least in Portugal, th there was never such a thing. Actually, on the contrary, the more countries restricted, Salazar said, well, over one million people worked in the wine industry, so uh, we don't really care. What, what, what he said, well, he was a you know, terrible dictator, but he was right on that, I think. And guess what? The more you actually forbid alcohol, it's like the forbidden fruit of Adam and Eve again, the worst. And guess who said that too? Adam Smith, and that's amazing. He talks about the Spaniards and everything. Now, the next quotation is really interesting. Like I was telling you, instead of showing graphs and stuff, we can hear from the master. Adam Smith says, it deserves to be remarked that, to that, if we consult experience, the cheapness of, wi of wine seems not to be a cause, not of drunkenness, but of sobriety. Wow. The inhabitants of the wine countries are in general the soberest people in Europe. Witness the Spaniards. Hello. The Italians. Some of them there. And the inhabitants of the southern provinces of France. People are seldom guilty of excesses in what is they dearly fair. Nobody affects the character of liberality and good fellowship by being profuse of a liquor which is as cheap as a small beer. On the contrary, and now the most important part, in the countries which, either from excessive heat or cold, produce no grapes, and where wine consequently is dear and a rarity, drunkenness is a common vice. So, again... I mean, make it accessible to all, or, and then you'll see that no one will care. Actually, when something is dear and a rarity, it will also be more expensive. And now I would like to follow with Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman explains so well the effects of dr the, the government criminalizing drugs and drug-related actions. He says that actually, by making it illegal for participants to join the market, you know, the small dealers, Government is unintentionally providing the cartels, the big dealers of drugs, to actually reap a monopoly profit. There is to supply the, the product only at a very high price and secure an economic rent provided through re legislation. So who is benefiting out of this? The big dealers. Um, but the arrests, I mean, when the police catches you know, people, they are usually the so-called little fish in English or... Small servants, you know, people who are just trading one gram or something. And those are not even the violent ones. I mean, then you have a society in which basically you're catching the wrong people, catching those who are just, you know, trading very small amounts. They are the poor. They are trying to actually make the price go down with these good effects. And besides, I'm not even arguing that this is a voluntary action between consenting adults. But the thing is that drug pro prohibition is not much wiser than alcohol prohibition. It's more or less the same thing. It's like protecting drug cartels and the prices are set too high and um, no one can really, I mean, compete with them. They won't be caught because, I mean, they won't risk their lives. They will actually force through violent mean people to trade below them for them to be caught. And um, so basically what you have is a very interesting situation that for me to summarize, I'll tell you like this. As it happens with all economic regulation, trying to steer the economic activity from top down generates unintended consequences. The intended results are never achieved. So the war on drugs propagates drugs, imprisons victims, and grants monopolies and richness to the real criminals. All of this is done with public taxpayers' money. So we're actually paying to imprison those who are, you know, the victims, and we are just providing a rent to the leaders, to the drug cartels, 
and everybody is fine with this. Oh, when I say here that actually propagates the drugs, I had here a further argument saying that these prices high are the ones who actually multiply the number of drugs you have available, such as crack, and th uh, such as crack, which is like an invention composed of cocaine in order to lower the prices. Just in three minutes, let us go then to the uh, case of Portugal. Portugal was, uh, you know, a doomed country in the 80s. I lived in, I, I lived in the 80s. I remember being like three or four years old and it was terrible. I remember thinking that, you know, thinking of youth, you, the word youth was for me some bunch of guys, you know, dressed in black who were actually drug addicts and things like that. There were syringes on the floor everywhere. Portugal was a country rich enough to afford it and poor enough and stupid enough to actually uh, take them. So I think it's a case study. It was like the worst country in, in these terms in, of the European Union and, uh, and things like that. So what did we do? Actually a huge debate. The extreme left won, guess what? This was you know, by the extreme left and there was this uh, socialist party uh, prime minister who did this on the 1st of January. Uh, he decriminalized all drugs including cocaine and heroin. I could show you the graphs. But if you look at the graphs, then you'll see just that everything is blossoming, it's like flourishing from this moment on. The drug addicts, the number of drug addicts is just going downhill completely. The, you know, the diseases transmitted through the use of needles and so on and so forth has decreased, but so much that it's, you know, completely under control now, especially for a country with such a problem, and so on and so forth. And, um, and basically, the only compulsory part is that we force the drug addicts to enter into some state-run state programs with methadone and things like that, who are actually, I'm not uh, looking at, you know, I, 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 I am. And I think that if you consult the, da the data, there's a, a Cato paper from which I'm quoting this from Glenn Greenwald. He completely explained and very well what happened and how good this was. And yes, Portugal could manage this problem and now I think that we are an example. As Students for Liberty used to say, liberty works, let's give it a try. And I would add something, probably the last, the last slide of all. Liberty works indeed, as you used to say, but it also favors virtue. And I think that's a great thing. Thank you.